I'm David Rupp, the director of the Canadian Institute, and we welcome you here to the Institute, especially people who have not been here before, um, for our lecture series. As I uh, said in Greek, our program this um, fall is different and interesting. Different in the sense that we are, we have um, three lectures that relate to historical topics, and they relate to uh, mostly about Greece, but also Greek-Canadian relations. And that uh, uh, this uh, topic today, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about our speaker, uh, James uh, Horncastle, in just a second, um, is part of our mission. In other words, our mission is not strictly archaeology, <laughs> not strictly the uh, pre-antique world or the antique world and, and earlier, but we also are interested in the, in the later periods and especially in Greek uh, history and culture as well as Canadian. So that this is going to, as we can see, um, we're talking about the uh, origins of the Cold War and it's the relationship of the Greek Civil War to that. Um, we then, uh, on the 26th of November, uh, we have the um, um, chair of the Canadian Studies Chair from New York University, Professor Anastasios Gekas, who's going to talk about, give us an introduction to his um, research which re relates to the uh, economy of Greece in the 19th century. In other words, uh, looking at the, um, uh, uh, the formation of the modern Greek state and um, as I have seen myself uh, uh, in a very non-professional way, uh, essentially, the Greek economy until really uh, uh, the mid um, after the First World War was a regional, a series of regional economies with the center not that economically strong uh, from this. And he's going to look into these uh, so-called Spanish states, these uh, regions of Greece that at one point were uh, much more economic and one might say political power than they do today. And then on Wednesday, December 10th, we have a uh, another graduate student, uh, uh, Christ Christopher Grafos uh, from uh, York University, and he's going to uh, present uh, part of a, a bigger project, which is uh, uh, the Greek uh, Canadian History Project, and he's looking at uh, migration to Canada, in particular to Toronto, uh, in the uh, latter part of the 19th uh, through, through the present. So he's going to be looking at Greek immigrant life in Toronto, um, and the role of memory that this plays. So that these are three uh, interesting and different topics, and uh, uh, I think that, uh, especially for here in Athens, uh, well, should be unusual topics, because uh, as far as I know, they have not been discussed before. And then on Wednesday, the 5th of November, the film that I thought was coming last winter, spring, uh, in which I had advertised almost, uh, and then it was, taken from my grasp. Um, our man in, um, in Tehran, um, many of you saw the movie Argo, uh, which was a couple of years ago, two, year, two, three years ago, about uh, what uh, the Canadian ambassador, uh, Ken uh, Taylor, did to save uh, a group of uh, Americans in 1979 during the uh, uh, Tehran hostage situation. Well, this is a documentary, a, a very well-received documentary, that tells the real story. Okay, um, and that uh, uh, it's an interesting one. Um, the Argo is an interesting presentation of uh, uh, fact and entertainment, but this will tell you uh, our man in Toronto will, will uh, uh, develop the the, the the background to that, and then you will be able to figure out how filmmakers take artistic license uh, and create a story that works and works for Hollywood as well. Um, now, we in the winter, we are already planning for the winter spring, <clears throat> and so we will have uh, more archaeology. So those of you who uh, are addicted to archaeology, you never fear the winter will uh, fill your, uh, fill your uh, I my name hearts and minds with uh, archaeological topics. And many of them, many of these lectures we hope are with uh, individuals who are working with our projects, Greek, Greek colleagues working with them. So we will finalize that in the, uh, in the 
coming month, then uh, I just to let you know. Uh, one thing I should note, uh, uh, the December 10th uh, uh, lecture will be also our, our kickoff to the holiday season. So we'll have our balls wine and, and other things uh, along with that. So that's what we're uh, talking about. Uh, one thing I, I one of the reasons I was late and then I caught in traffic was that uh, this topic somehow uh, has some res uh, resonance to what's happening in Ottawa. Unfortunately, uh, there's been a terrorist uh, event in the on Parliament Hill in the Parliament, and so this is brings back the fact that uh, um, while the Cold War might be over, other wars are are heating up. So uh, it's it's um, uh, makes one uh, think about. Um, uh, what is what is stable in this world, and what is uh, ephemeral? Uh, violence, unfortunately, seems to be stable. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce uh, James uh, Horncastle to you, sitting here up front. He comes from New Brunswick, on the on the east coast, and uh, he has his uh, undergraduate degree uh, in honors from St. Thomas University, and then went on to get his MA uh, from the University of New Brunswick. His uh, is the both degrees in history. He decided to leave the Maritimes and go to the West Coast, and he's now a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Simon Fraser University, and he's uh, studying the the broader question, the broader issues of the Macedonian question, the Greek Civil War, and the beginning of the Cold War uh, between 1946 and 1949 as as his uh, doctoral dissertation. Um, when I when I read what he has published and what he's done, I was looking for an older man. And then I find a, 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 a younger one, uh, he's, because he has already ex published extensively on both political and uh, military matters related to Southeastern Europe, um, as well as more specifically on military affairs. Um, he has written has recently published a paper in the Journal of Slavic Military Studies called Reaping the Whirlwind, Total National Defense Role in Slovenia's Bid for Succession. Um, he is working on papers relating to the Greek Navy's role in the First Balkan War. Um, go down and see the Avro. Have you seen the Avro? Yes. Okay. There's one of the, the stalwarts for that war. Um, and also the relationship that exists between technology and modern military doctrine. Um, he um, is a junior, junior affiliate of the Canadian Network for Research on Terrorism, that word, Security and Society, member of the Modern Greek Studies Association, Association of Slavic, East European, and Near Asian Studies, and the Society for uh, Military History. So what he's going to help us to do is to see the uh, Greek Civil War, um, uh, that occurred almost immediately after the, uh, uh, the free, freeing of Greece from the, uh, uh, from the German occupation and how that fits into the, the bigger picture of the Cold War. And I'm looking up very much forward and uh, I will hope to not have touched anything. Sorry about James, please welcome. Well, thank you for your kind words and thank you everybody for showing up. Thank you for having me this evening. Okay. Thess uh, Thessaloniki is a, an old uh, port, isn't it? You should seize it. This is Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin, without prompting while speaking to a delegation from Yugoslavia in 1946 and demonstrating complete disparity in contemporary history, proposed that Yugoslavia should work towards annexing northern Greece and incorporating it into Yugoslavia. Stalin's purpose in proposing this radical geopolitical shift remains unknown. From other available documentation, it is clear that the USSR was well aware of its limitations to impose a political solution on Greece. Yet Stalin, in 1946, appears to be encouraging Josip Broz Tito, the leader of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, and second only to Tito himself in international <coughs> prestige, to pursue a policy that he actively opposed. While at the surface level contradictory, a close examination of the political developments during this period will reveal that a growing Eastern Bloc involvement in the soon-to-be-launched Greek Civil War was part of the emerging Cold War dynamics that were soon to consume geopolitics for the following 45 years. 
The Greek Civil War, despite being the opening phase of the Cold War struggle between the Soviet <coughs> Union and the United States of America, has received scant attention by Cold War scholars. Between 1946 and 1949, the Greek Civil War, which would hit the government-led National Army of Greece against the communist-led uh, Democratic Army of Greece, would consume post-war Greek society and leave political legacies that continue to this day. Nevertheless, despite the Greek Civil War clearly being the Western and Eastern economy that defines Cold War studies, has only received minimal attention by scholars, and usually only due to the extent that it was the foundation for the Truman Doctrine, the start of the United States policy of containment. While its role in, fa in facilitating the Truman Doctrine was certainly significant, the Greek Civil War, in many respects, was responsible for many of the major trends and themes that would define the conflict as a As the first political arena in which the East and West struggled for political domination, the Greek Civil War played a significant role in shaping the next 45 years of international history. This presentation will demonstrate the Greek Civil War, far from being a minor event in the Cold War, instead defined the way in which the world would understand the next 45 years of global history. First, in a moment when the East-West divide was still very much amorphous, the Greek Civil War served as a rallying call for what would become NATO and the Warsaw Pact to define their personal identities, either a struggle for national emancipation and liberty, as the Soviet Union and the satellites argue, or for the protection of rule, law, and democracy. America, Britain, and its allies would argue they were performing in Greece. Second, the Greek Civil War was the first uh, quote, war by proxy of the Cold War, as war by proxies uh, would be the primary means by which the USSR and the United States would wage war against one another during the Cold War. Exam examining the lessons learned by both parties during the Greek Civil War informed, informed them of how to reach conflicts in the future. Third, and perhaps most critically, the Greek Civil War would demonstrate how fragile bloc alliances were, and how proxy states would often subvert the interests of their benefactors for their own personal gain. Specifically, Yugoslavia's involvement in the Greek Civil War and the USSR's growing disenchantment with the independent policies of the so-called satellite state, would lead to Tito Stalin's split in 1948. Though the Greek Civil War to act as a catalyst, it's impossible to say whether such a break would have occurred. The Greek Civil War, either directly or indirectly, would take the way that the Cold War would be fought, perceived, and, and conducted for the next 45 years, and thus historical research was significantly benefited from, uh, from their greater integration. In order to understand the Greek Civil War, however, one must examine Greece's experiences during the Second World War. Although the three round that exist, the argument that the Greek Civil War actually consisted of three distinct periods between 1943 and 1949 is contentious, what is undeniable is that the experiences and actions of the Greek Civil War informed the, uh, er, informed the uh, Greek Civil War. Specifically, the wartime resistance and the government in exile's attempt to reintegrate itself into Greek society after being removed for three years will play a significant role in the Greek Civil War. When German, Italian, and Bulgarian forces occupied Greece in the spring of 1941, the government, rather than remaining country, fled to exile. Here on the map, you can see the different occupation zones, with uh, red, red being the uh, uh, or Italian, green being the Bulgarian, and blue the uh, German. The, uh, the occupation left a political void in mainland Greece that would eventually be filled by the wartime resistance. The resistance filled this void, however, uh, only after occupation policies of the Axis forces became readily apparent in the famine of 1941-42 would kill between 300,000 and 450,000 people. With the reality of the Axis occupation now apparent to the Greek population, a true nationwide resistance could be formed. Uh, or organized resistance in occupied Greece would take three principal forms. The National Liberation Front, AOM, a center-left resistance organization that was heavily influenced by the KKE, managed to become the chief resistance organization in Greece. This was both due to its pan-national appeal, a strict curtailing of KKE's typical rhetoric, which tends to alienate society, and the fact that the political right in Greece, much like elsewhere in occupied Europe, was being discredited through its pre-war policies and association with the occupation. The National uh, Republican Greek League, EDES, which was uh, formed by Napoleon Zervis, initially embraced republicanism and centralist policies. It however, was increasing, uh, it, however, became increasingly associated with the government in exile. As service, in order to, make, to secure British support, then the bill based on the monarchy question and pledges the loyalty to the 
Edison's term would, in time, cause it to embrace a distinctive right-wing approach to domestic politics. Although Edison was prominent in terms of support that they received for the British, the organization was largely regional in nature and based in Yenna and possessed only a limited national appeal. Final, finally, the National Social Liberation, ECA, a centrist Republican organization that was largely situated in the central Greece, constituted the third major resistance organization in Greece. Alas, however, would eliminate ECA in April 1944 as part of its efforts to consolidate control over Greek resistance. As a result, by mid-1944, Greek resistance, in many respects, was already polarized between the political left, which had performed the majority of the resistance acts, and it had national appeal, and right-wing organizations like Edis, which, although possessing regional appeal, were secondary actors and dependent on both British and Greek government in exile for their position. The British further complicated the resistance struggle, as the Foreign Office and the Special Operations Executive were not in alignment on the issue. The Foreign Office, along with Winston Churchill, was decidedly in favor of Edis and uh, the Greek government in exile, as both promised to restore the monarchy in the post-war period. The SOE, with its orders to, quote, set Europe ablaze, was significantly more inclined to support Alas, as it promised to uh, deliver more immediate results than this. Furthermore, the SOE, by its nature uh, an irregular organization, attract an eclectic range of individuals that were not necessarily predisposed to support the monarchy, and thus caused them to further support last first attacks against the occupation authorities. The divide in British policy would help spur the hopes of both parties to their mutual detriment. The impact of Britain's divided support on the resistance was best seen in Operation Animals. Animals was an allied deception operation designed to convince the Axis that Operation Husky the invasion of Sicily would occur anywhere but there. A key part of the operation was the Allies encouraging the Greek resistance to attack on all fronts in order to convince the Germans that an invasion of the region was needed. While a successful operation, the failure of an Allied invasion force to arrive in Greece spurred the Greek resistance to turn their arms against one another in an effort to secure dominance in the post-war period. Although outside pressure eventually caused the last two halt its offensive, irreparable damage had been dealt to Eka and the last since actions to take control of all resistance in Greece caused outsiders to further view the struggle between black and white forces. In 1944, the newly appointed Prime Minister of the Greek government in exile, George Papandreou, was successful in bringing Alas into a unity government under a raising of the Greek Nevertheless, the agreement was short-lived. The breakdown was in part due to the existing political divides between the two major groups and disagreements over the structure of the new army. Thus, as the Germans withdrew from Athens in October 1944, the lines between the last, on one hand, and the Greek government in exile, Edis, and former occupation <coughs> supporting groups, on the other, crystallized. All that was needed was a spark. Although the precise unfolding of the Decembriana December events is open to contestation, the results are not. On 3 December 1944, government and British forces seeking to break up an alas inspired demonstration, fired into the protesters in Sintama Square, killing 28 protesters and wounding 100, or further 148. This allegedly unprovoked attack served to spur alas and supporters into open rebellion against government forces. Critically, however, and for reasons that still remain debated, alas left its elite battle-hardened trained forces in the north and allowed the Athenian branch, which had minimal experience in warfare, to shoulder the brunt of the fighting in Athens. Alas's display in bringing its elite, er, delay in bringing its elite forces to bear proved costly, as the British were able to dispatch the 4th Indian Division, which was able to stabilize the government's collection of army, police, and paramilitary units. With the additional forces, the Greek government in exile, now under leadership of Prime Minister Nikolaos uh, Pastiras, uh, were able to force Alas into submission. This was due in part because Yugoslavia, acting under domestic and international pressure, Back out of a commitment to support Alas. Alas signed the Varkiza Agreement on 12 February 1945, which, although promising to hold free and fair elections, was a de facto defeat for Yam Alas as they had to surrender their arms. Although not our, all arms were handed over, enough were handed over that Alas was effectively the only military force. And here in the image here, you can see this is the immediate aftermath of the shooting on 3rd December 1944.
The defeat of Hamas in the winter of 1945 would not be the end of the right without tensions of the Instead, the right, now with the not and use of force, would initiate what would become known as the White Terror. Where our former collaborators with the Axis were welcomed into the government and then turned against former Alasse on members. The result was that when the elections were finally held in 1946, the leader of the KKE, Nico Sahariadis, in a decision that is still contested to this day, refused to participate. The KKE's refusal to participate resulted in an overwhelmingly right-wing majority in the parliament in 1946. While the left was unlikely to win the elections at this stage, a reactionary government helped further to divide the existing Greek society, legitimized the right to white terror, and convinced many on the left that there was no option to deal with the civil war. Sorry for the long background, but it helps contextualize a lot of what's about to happen. The Greek Civil War would consume uh, Greek society between 1946 and 1949. The old wounds of the resistance were opened up once more, and then, like the Decembriana, would be closed only after three years of bitter conflict. <coughs> For the first half of the conflict, the communist led Democratic Army of Greece, DAG, would engage in a guerrilla warfare campaign that the government national led National Army of Greece uh, could not effectively unload. It was only when the DAG switched from an irregular to a conventional force and desperate bid to end the war while it still had nominal influence that the organization's defeat became a possibility. The Democratic Army of Greece, despite coming within kilometers of seizing Athens in the summer of 1948, ultimately failed in its efforts to beat the National Army of Greece in the second battle. The Democratic Army of Greece, now forced to fight a conventional conflict against an army that was designed for set piece battles, was in a precarious position. The National Army of Greece would, in the summer of 1949, decisively defeat the Democratic Army of Greece in the Greek Civil War. 158,000 Greeks died over the course of a three-year conflict, and over 1 million became internally displaced refugees. Furthermore, it solidified the divides within Greek society that still persist. Critical to the Greek Civil War being a drawn-out conflict was the support that both parties received from external powers. The government-led National Army of Greece would rely heavily on the support of first Great Britain, and then when they withdrew due to declining fortunes of the British Empire, the United States. Specifically, the United States, fearing a communist takeover in Greece and Turkey, would develop the Truman Doctrine in March of 1947, which promised aid to governments fighting communist threats, specifically those faced by Greece and Turkey. While the Democratic Army of Greece eventually helped the advantage in combat against the National Army of Greece, due to the government's continued emphasis on the gendarme meaning for uh, maintaining civic order, British and American support kept it from being overwhelmed in the initial stages of the conflict. Likewise, the Democratic Army of Greece benefited from the fact that whenever the National Army of Greece gained a temporary tactical advantage against the Balkans forces, which were concentrated in the north, it would retreat to Albania, Yugoslavia, or Bulgaria, reconstitute their forces, re-enter the country in areas where the National Army of Greece was born. You can see this best on this image here. This includes all the major supply lines from the communist uh, countries into Greece, and also the various bases, including hospitals, munitions, supplies, training centers, that existed immediately on, along the border. As you can see, it is fairly easy for the Democratic Army of Greece to withdraw and then re-enter the country at a later date. Uh, only when Yugoslavia, the major supplier and supporter of the Democratic Army of Greece, closed its borders with, uh, with the country was the DAG's position truly a reversal. On 16 October 1949, Nikos Sahariadis, Secretary General of the KKE, officially acknowledged the defeat of the conflict. This brings us to the relationship in the Greek Civil War with the Cold War. Cold War logic dictated that the two superpowers, especially once they acquired nuclear weapons, could not engage each other in direct conflict. Although the two armed forces often engaged one another, for example, when Soviet pilots flew Chinese fighter jets in the Korean War against American pilots, this only occurred in instances where one side or the other had plausible deniability about their involvement. Instead, both sides often used other nations as proxy forces to advance their interests in the region. Whether it was pitting one state against another, as was the case with Ethiopia and Somalia, or in support of different factions in civil, civil conflict, as we see in Greece and as we would see later in other countries like Ecuador. 
The Greek Civil War, because it occurred before the advent of nuclear weapons, is often neglected in discussion for the Cold War. Yet it was the first proxy war between the East and West. As the Cold War has an amorphous beginning, some historians dating situated as early as 1944, <coughs> and others dated as late as 29 August 1949, when the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic bomb, the Greek Civil War, in many instances, does not fit into the standard periodization of the Cold War. As the decisive battle of the Greek Civil War, the Battle of Grand Spitzi, it was finalized on precisely 29 August 1949. The periodization of the Cold War means that the Greek Civil War occupies an ambiguous position in its historiography, and as a result, is often not dealt with in detail. As a result, scholars of the Cold War do not <coughs> examine it in detail, but nevertheless, examining the impact of the Greek Civil War on the superpowers demonstrates that many of the dimensions that would define the Cold War were either given their initial shape or impetus by the Greek Civil War. The most obvious legacy of the Greek Civil War was the impact it had upon the local climate, perhaps the most recognizable characteristic of the Cold War. The United States and its allies in one camp, and the Soviet Union and its allies in another camp, were the defining characteristic of this period. This alignment was so characteristic of the uh, Cold War that its development is often taken for granted. And nevertheless, various states in the 1940s that would become aligned with either the Warsaw Pact or NATO, such as Italy or Czechoslovakia, were not definitively associated with their future blocks of this. Other powers, most notably Yugoslavia, would find themselves on the out of their respective alliance block as a result of the Greek Civil War. The conflict made the United States and the Soviet Union realize how tenuous their positions at the head of their nominal alliance blocks were, and that they would have to actively work to maintain them. As a result, the Greek Civil War is pivotal to find the total war in a manner. At the commencement of the Greek Civil War, the blocks, as we know them, did not exist. The expansion of the Greek Civil War, which in reality was an international conflict, serves to solidify the bloc alignment. This was particularly the case in Western Europe. In post-Second World War Italy, the wartime resistance, which as in Greece had primarily been left-leaning in orientation, was off well on its way to electoral success. By 1947, the Greek Civil War, however, it caused the United States to shift its focus from allowing post-war Europe to develop in a manner that would, to the communist takeover throughout the region, actively funding and supporting right-wing parties in local elections. This went so far as the United States, as McSherry notes, uh, to intervene and to ensure that Italy's 1948 election was not won by the left-wing popular democratic front, to carry over the common terms of popular front strategy of the 1930s, but instead by the Christian Democrats. As one CIA operative described the organizations in activity, we had bags of money that we delivered to selected politicians, defray their political expenses, their campaign expenses, for posters, for pamphlets, etc. CIA involvement would go so far as producing forged letters by the Communist Party of Italy in a successful uh, effort to damage their political standing. While the Soviet Union was also funding the Communist Party of Italy, it is clear from the archival records that not only was the United States better at it, for the time being, but it also supplies significantly more money that the USSR, which is still in the process of rebuilding the Soviet state after the Second World War, could not. In fact, the US, through the CIA, would continue to involve itself in Italian politics for the next 24 years in order to ensure that the left-wing government is sympathetic to the communist did not take hold. According to, Greek, er, according to American politicians, a repeat of the Greek Civil War, where America initially stood idle, was no longer a viable strategy. American fears of further Greece's would result in the foundation of NATO on 4 April 1949, months before the end of the Greece of War. NATO, based on the principle of mutual defense, would remain the bedrock of the United States' efforts to prevent expansion of communism in Europe. Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, the aforementioned Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States would be the founding member of NATO. Turkey and Greece, unsurprisingly given the impetus that they had in its formation, would join the organization <laughs> Geographical quibbles aside, NATO would become identified as the principal component of Western Bloc, and the initial expansion to include Greece and Turkey after the Greece Civil War was demonstrative of the importance that the United States assigned to Greece and Europe's overall security. 
the United States was not the only superpower to work to uh, work to uh, construct its bloc as a result of the Greek Civil War. Soviet involvement in the Greek Civil War, contrary to traditional historiographical accounts, was not motivated by the power politic considerations of acquiring a warm water port like this. The Soviet Union, in fact, was drawn into the Greek Civil War against its better judgment by its Balkan allies, specifically Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, which had been operating largely independently of Soviet support, had involved itself in the Greek Civil War to help eliminate internal pressure caused by a natural question in the multi ethnic state. As the Soviet Union was attempting to solidify its control of Eastern Europe in the aftermath of the Second World War, Yugoslav, uh, Bulgarian, and Albanian involvement in the conflict, as Massey notes, actually served to undermine its interest in the region by drawing Western attention to its growing strength. The Soviet Union had previously secured its dominance in Eastern Europe at the Fourth Moscow Conference in 1944 through the Persanges Agreement. Churchill, eager to save the Greek monarchy and state, made an agreement with Stalin where he and Great Britain would recognize the Soviet Union's de facto control of Eastern Europe if the Soviet Union would permit British dominance in Greece. Albanian, Bulgarian, Yugoslav involvement in the Greek Civil War served to undermine this agreement. And to show how Calcite politics was done at this time, when uh, Stalin was given the piece of paper with the percentages on it, Stalin just took a check or a pencil and check marked it. You can actually find that document in the archives today. As a result, the Soviet Union was forced to speed up. As a result of uh, Albanian, Bulgarian, and Yugoslav uh, involvement in Greece, the Soviet Union was forced to speed up its assimilation of the Eastern Bloc to ensure that they were uh, only loyal to the Soviet Union. Starting in 1948, when Western concerns over Soviet intervention in the Greek Civil War reached its peak, the Soviet Union began to shed the vestiges of popular front governments in the Eastern Bloc. The February 1948 revolution in Czechoslovakia was initiated in part but the Soviet Union's growing sense of anxiety over its lack of control of its nominally Balkan satellite states. Likewise, Poland, Hungary, and Romania were <coughs> all disposed of the popular front governments in 1948. While geopolitical considerations beyond the Balkans cannot be ignored, the Soviet Union's growing sense of insecurity caused by the independent actions of the Balkan states in the Greek Civil War were at the heart of the matter. Immediately prior to the Czechoslovak Revolution of 1948, Stalin had called the Bulgarians and Yugoslavs to Moscow on the nominal pretense of discussing the economics, but in reality it chastised them for their independent action in the Greek Civil War. In particular, the Bulgarian communist leader Dimitrov's comment that the Balkans, including Greece, would be involved in a mass uh, Balkan federation, this comment he gave to the press, drew unnecessary attention to communist activity in the region. Dimitrov's inclusion of Greece started the West and upset the Soviet Union's careful timetable for, quote, Sovietization of the Eastern Bloc. While Czechoslovakia's domestic situation caused the USSR to accelerate it even more than they otherwise desired, the Soviets losing control of the bloc meant that control had to be established as quickly as possible, as Stalin himself confirmed in Molotov in a 1948 conversation. Stalin's solution to losing control uh, over the Balkan satellite states in their involvement in the Greek Civil War uh, besides forcibly integrating them, was to create an effective other against which to rally the bloc, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is the strongest and most independent actor of the developing Eastern Bloc, was from the Soviet Union's <coughs> perspective the perfect country of which to make an example. Although Stalin had encouraged Yugoslavia to act in its Greece in 1946, he was, based off available evidence, simply placating the Yugoslav communists in an attempt to bring them under Soviet supervision, as he had done with countless other parties. Stalin, when his tactic failed, and with Yugoslav involvement in the Greek Civil War becoming increasingly embarrassing to Soviet government, chose the extreme response of attempting to depose Tito. Throughout the spring of 1948, the Soviet Union withdrew its support for Yugoslavia, and at the 28 June 1948 meeting at the Common Forum, which was the successor to the Organization of Communist International, the Soviet Union condemned Yugoslavia for, quote, its Titoist national deviationism from Marxist Latinist thought. <laughs> the other satellite states, sensing that the Yugoslavs have fallen from their privileged position in the communist hierarchy, joined in the attacks with great zeal, eager <coughs> to avenge the previous slice perpetrated by the Yugoslavs. Uh, the Soviet Union, claiming that Titoism had infected all the Eastern Bloc countries, pressured the remaining parties to eliminate any individuals who did not conform to the Soviet norm. 
i.e. those who pursued policies with the explicit, explicit written consent of the Soviet Union. Thus, the Soviet Union, using the excuse of Yugoslavia's independence streak in Greece, was able to purge the Eastern Bloc communist parties of individuals who were resistant to dominance. This is the reason that Soviet rule, except the notable exceptions, was never effectively challenged by the satellite states in the Cold War. Yugoslavia, however, did not succumb to Soviet pressure. Instead, the Yugoslav resistance to, to it would give rise to another defining characteristic of the Cold War, the non-aligned movement. The non-aligned movement was an attempt by the various states, particularly in the Third World, to avoid entanglement of bloc politics. Although most of the major states of the movement were sympathetic to one bloc or the other, Yugoslavia had to reconcile with the USSR in 1955 decided it favored it in international politics. It remained a viable alternative for many countries seeking to avoid bloc pressure. Had so Yugoslavia not become so heavily involved in the Greek Civil War, it's unlikely the non-aligned movement would have been as successful. The non-aligned movement, as Kula notes, benefited from the international prestige of Tito, a successful resistance fighter against the Germans and political leader against the Soviet Union, lent the movement as a whole. And here you can actually see it's the first meaning of the non-aligned movement. The United States learned both uh, political and, and tactical lessons from the Civil War, although admittedly only the political lessons lasted for the majority of the Cold War. Tactically, the United States Army learned the methods needed to successfully defeat an enemy insurgency force, with an emphasis on well-trained, general-purpose <coughs> infantry, which could serve a variety of roles. It was only after dismantling the British-trained hunter units, designed to replicate German anti-partisan Jaeger units, that the National Army of Greece made significantly, significant headway against the Democratic Army of Greece. The Americans had actually codified this lesson to the Guerrilla Warfare Training Manual, or COIN Manual, in the 1950s. However, in 1958, the United States, for reasons that remain unclear, I have not found a document that explicitly states why, and I have not seen an explanation for it, completely revised their anti-insurgency manual and emphasize special forces for hunting and uh, insurgency forces and employing conscript infantry for holding ground. In other words, the United States returned to the failed lessons of the British in Greece. As Vietnam would demonstrate, this would prove to be a disaster, as the special forces were generally ineffective at achieving a theater-wide operational effect, and the conscript infantry, often poorly trained, were ill-suited for winning the trust of the local population. One lesson learned in the Greek Civil War, paid for in both American and Greek blood, was lost at a time when it could have been put to good use. Here, that's just an organizational chart of special forces. I just like the look of it. I like force organization charts as a military historian. <laughs> the success of containment in Greece, more than the actual reasons behind it, as Hero Matos notes, would guide American policy for much of the Cold War. Containment, in turn, led the United States uh, becoming involved in military and espionage operations in er, multiple countries throughout the world. Containment ideology directly led to the American success in Korea, where it successfully halted North Korea's takeover of the entire peninsula, and its failures in Vietnam. Containment would also cause the expansion of CIA, which exposed a number of communist sympathetic or left-wing governments throughout the Cold War. These operations, however, would lead to the creation of what intelligence experts refer to as blowback, the unintended consequences from the initial act. This was most notably the case in Iran, where the American and British backing of the Shah of Iran in 1953 during Operation Ajax, which was actually justified using the case study of Greece as a successful politics for the communism, would create resentment within Iran that would eventually lead to the Shah's downfall and replacement by the Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979. Although there was a variety of reasons for why these acts were carried out that go beyond the Greek Civil War, in each of the aforementioned instances, Greece was cited as a specific example for why the U.S. should intervene and how such interve intervention could uh, obtain positive effects. Thus, not, uh, not only did the Greek Civil War impact the Cold War, but indirectly continues to affect the present from the lessons learned and misused. Critically and worth noting was that the unit, United States learned many of its policies and failure er, policies from its successes during the period of the Greek Civil War, rather than its failures. This uh, is clearly the case when one compares the lessons learned from the Greek Civil War and that with the Chinese Civil War, which occurred concurrently. As the Greek
Korean Civil War was a success. It caused the United States to take a hardline stance against communism elsewhere in the world, even when the lines between nationalism and communism were blurred, as was the case with Vietnam. The United States stance in China, where it misread the situation and took a softer stance, was disregarded as impractical, which caused it to disregard such strategies in future operations. Rather than learn the reasons behind their failures, the United States sought to replicate its success in Greece throughout the world. Cuba and Vietnam were two countries where the inability to learn from this failure would result in multiple loss opportunities and severe losses for the United States. The United States was not alone in learning lessons from the Greek Civil War, as the USSR also learned several important lessons, and they mostly in its policy sphere as well. Specifically, the USSR learned that it could only directly attack U.S. interests on the periphery, and that it lacked the means to directly engage the United States. Historians have often attributed the USSR's caution in the Greek Civil War to its lack of atomic weapons. This, however, was not the case. The Soviet Union had other reasons for not involving itself in uh, the Greek Civil War. Its agreement as we, uh, with the British, as we previously examined, but also its relative weakness in naval affairs. Joseph Stalin, in the 1948 meeting with the Yugoslavs and Bulgarians, specifically stated that the Democratic Army of Greece could never uh, succeed in Greece as the USSR lacked an effective navy to support it. The United States could rely on deploy the resources needed to succeed in Greece and the Soviet Union because it lacked an effective navy could not halt this process. The Soviet Union would take away two important lessons from the Soviet Union. First, it stood the best chance of spreading communist ideology in areas of limited strategic concern to the United States. Second, in order to pursue its strategic objectives at the global level, as Winkler notes, it would have to expand its navy. While Winkler does not connect the Greek Civil War to the broader Cold War issues, as we have discussed before, he does note that the Soviet anxiety over not being able to achieve its influence beyond the country's border and spurred it to build a fleet, with the first case of this being in Greece. The Soviet Union, while a European uh, power, had an ideology that caused itself to uh, regard itself as a global power, Marxist Leninism. Marxist Lenin thought viewed imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. The period of decolonization, <coughs> Marxist Leninism was able to be eminently adaptable to the global context. And the United States, through the lessons it learned in the Greek Civil War, undermined its global appeal. Its actions in countries like Greece weakened its claims that it was a supporter of liberty. The majority of national liberation movements in Latin America, Africa, and Asia were decidedly left in orientation and in opposition to the conservative colonial orders that they imposed. The United States, by intervening in Greece and other countries to preserve the political status quo, was often viewed as indirect support of the global order. As a result, the Soviet Union directly exploited the lesson learned by the, uh, from the United States and Greece that it could successfully intervene in countries to maintain the status quo. Greece may have been a proxy battle waged between the Balkan countries and the United States, but the Soviet Union did not ignore the lessons of conflict. Greece was the first major instance of war by proxy. The Cold War was the first major instance of war by proxy in the Cold War, and this was not lost in the Soviet Union. In terms of military hardware, the Soviet Union recognized its material limitations in the aftermath of the Cold War, third Greek Civil War. The first means that the Soviet Union sought to overcome this limitation, however, was via expanding its naval capabilities, a task that had actually continued throughout the Cold War and continues to do today. The Soviet Union, as Stalin acknowledged, had limited global reach due to its naval limitations in comparison to the United States. Given that the majority of its resources were located on the Eurasian mainland, and uh, its goal was support, er, supporting revolutionary movements globally, it did not need a large commercial fleet. Instead, as was demonstrated in Greece, it needed a navy capable of disrupting the flow of supplies from the United States to the rest of the world. As a result, the Soviet Union embarked on a massive submarine and destroyer building program throughout the Cold War. Although the Soviet Union was always defined this need in relation to NATO pact in Europe, it did so for political and prestige purposes. It could not explicitly state that having found its limitations in Greece, it needed to overcome them. Politically, given its role as a supporter of revolutionary movements on a global scale, admitting a failure was simply out of the question. And here we can see um, conflicts or conflicts and decolonization throughout the world. And this is where the Soviet Union kind of focuses activities. Okay, conclusion. 
pre-Civil War, although in the global scheme of the Cold War, both a small and relatively minor event, in reality helped determine many of the facets which would define the post-Second World War era. Like the Cold War, the Greek Civil War emerged directly from decisions reached in the Second World War, both within Greece's domestic politics and the interventions of foreign powers. The Greek Civil War was the first major round of the ideological conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, served to solidify many of the existing trends between the two countries. Bloc politics that defined the characteristic of the Cold War was solidified by the internal struggle of the <coughs> as both parties sought to use it to their advantage. Furthermore, the breaks within the blocs, amply demonstrated by Yugoslavia's involvement during the Civil War, began to emerge over this period. The superpowers, however, also learned to adjust their Cold War strategy and tactics from their involvement in the Greek Civil War. The United States, through its involvement in the Greek Civil War, learned that it could counter spread of communists and left with sympathetic ideologies. While successful in some instances, it also had the potential for significant blowback. Furthermore, the Soviet Union, learning from the Greek Civil War that it could not confront the United States in the areas of its direct interest, redirected its efforts to the global periphery, attempting to co opt the decolonization movement. Thus, while Greek Civil War historiography is often detached from the Cold War historiography, many of, its defining many of the defining characteristics of the latter were given shape by the former, and both could benefit from a greater integration. Thank you. I'm sure there must be some comments and questions for James, but this uh, a very detailed uh, examination of the, of the period in the 40s, mid 40s and late 40s of, uh, of uh, Greek history and the involvement of other countries must have stimulated something. I'm wondering who would be the first. not to focus on Greek civil war since we are in Greece, just try to expand our thought. The, the Cold War between the uh, USA and the uh, Soviet Union was basically an ideological um, conflict or of domination or dominance, what's the best word? Global. But, yeah, for, for political, uh, political, it was a combination of the two factors. And the fact that it was a combination of two factors was seen in the case of Greece, where in the case of the Soviet Union, they learned that they needed to increase their global appeal by associating with the decolonization movement. And with the United States, it used the argument that it was protecting law and order as a reason for many of its interventions in other countries even if it was a violation of law and order, but this was the common uh, argument that we used. There was, also the, there was also the military dimension as well, as we see with, in many instances when one country would involve itself, as in Vietnam, Afghanistan, throughout Africa, Latin America, what would happen is the other side would end up supplying them with arms and munitions in order to try to balance or disrupt the operations of the other power. I suppose you could say it was uh, ideology was a motivating factor, but not a determining factor, especially in Greece. But obviously, Stalin made a decision, but did not align with ideology. Um, other questions? Other uh, comments? Yes. Um, I'm not sure there's a specific answer to this, but uh, from my own family experience, uh, after the Greek Civil War and going beyond that for the next 20 years or so, when, mem when people from Greece, uh, for example, came to the United States, to New York, the, uh, um, the ones that were determined to be communists were not allowed into the country and often sent to uh, Canada, all, often not sent to, but went to Canada instead. There was a reference uh, previously to Toronto, and I, I have uh, something I didn't understand when I was young. Many relatives in Toronto, and it turns out they were all the communists, and all the others were, you know, were in the United States. The question I have, if it can be answered, 
was there any at all significant impact on Canada because of this? I, I know the numbers are probably small, but is there any significance to that? Uh, significance in terms of the increase in numbers? Though? Well, just uh, uh, is there? I don't even know because I'm not a Canadian. Is there a communist? Is there a communist party in Canada? And if so, did the Greeks who came over and were not allowed into the United States? Because it, it, it appears to me that none of my relatives came across the ocean to go to Canada. Pardon me, I'm sorry. But they came. They came to the United States, of course, because there were relatives here, uh, or you know, relatives there, and they ended up in Canada. So, did they add to any communist impact in Canada, or was there no communist impact there? I can only speak to the uh, New Brunswick context, and as anybody in knows, Canada can tell you that's a very small portion of Canada as a whole. Very small. But, uh, Still there. Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of the uh, local Greek community that uh, after the Civil War, there's almost there's almost been a refu uh, refusal to discuss any of the Civil War activities when it came over. Like there will be a mention that my or my grandfather or my uncle participated during the Greek Civil War, mm -hmm. but usually there's no mention of what side they participated mm -hmm. on because there, the community, given the size of the community, they don't want to divide the community from that point. Uh, okay. So that's. I'm sorry, that's not a full answer. But well, no, that gives me the, the right orientation that we, they sort of left things behind and they didn't make an open issue of it uh, back then. And like I say, I, until I was older, I didn't even know that all my relatives in Canada ended up being communists and all, all the ones that lived nearby me were at, at the other side. So you're basically saying there was not an, any kind of significant impact with, even within the Greek community. Yeah, at least at the New Brunswick Bay. Yeah, that's okay, a that's very good. small sample. Yeah, that's what I wanted yes. to know. That's good. Yes. Uh, have you studied uh, like the recent uh, effects of the end of the Cold War, the end of the Soviet Union, and the impact uh, of those Greeks who, you know, uh, the, the, left the, and li lived in Albania or uh, lived in uh, you know Yugoslavia, uh, and then wanted to return, uh, you know, to their homes and. You know, to kind of you know, reintegrate into society, and have you had some? I've done a research little bit. I, my research what have you found out? Until about yeah. the 1960s, with regards to Greece, but I know um, within the uh, 1970s and 80s, there was actually started to be a little bit of a lax along for a return of former Democratic Army Free soldiers. There was also the major issue of the children. The Democratic Army of Greece would take children uh, from villages and ship them throughout the Eastern Bloc under the pretense that it was saving them from the Soviet War. So it made it a ideological point within modern Greek historiography whether they were doing it to kidnap them or rescue them. That said, within the 70s and 80s, a lot of people started to return. And we actually see the uh, leader of the Democratic Army of Greece, uh, Marcos Vapiatis, in the 80s, he actually came back and was made a minister uh, in one of the governments. And I know this uh, from the offhand meeting, the discussion basically between the two was he was uh, meeting the president who was a former army officer, and the army officer introduced him and said, uh, hello comrade, and then he said, hello general. <laughs> so, uh, well, in a colloquial form, it's taken as a lot of ways of somewhat bridging the divide, although that divide still very much exists in uh, contemporary society. An experience that I have somewhat related to that, uh, and again, something that uh, is sort of new to me to recognize, is that uh, when I come back to Greece and, and live here, which I do in retirement now part of the year, I'm, I'm absolutely astounded at how much Russian I hear on the, uh, the, the metro and the Lerperio and the, the buses, excuse me, and uh, other places. And it culminated last um, uh, Febu February when I went to um, the, the Greek National Wrestling Championships. I know that sounds kind of funny to you. I don't know that anybody else here was there. <laughs> 
Um, and that, but I would have to say that at least 80% of the participants um, were Greek Russians. They all had, uh, you know, uh, their uniforms all had either uh, some kind of Russian flag or had were written in, in Russian rather than Greek. They all spoke to each other. I mean, the whole sections that I was sitting in in the stands, everybody was speaking Russian. They were not speaking Greek. So the impact of something like that, and these were all people, I talked to some of them and, and that, and they had, uh, many of them had come back recently, some had come back a long time ago. Actually, and that's uh, getting back to this photo that I put in here, because this is actually a lot of the evacuation sites for mm -hmm. uh, members of the Democratic Army, Greece, and children as they were shipped into the Eastern Bloc. With regards to the Soviet Union, I knew uh, a lot of cases, like uh, the leader of the KKE actually ended up fleeing to the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and then died in Central Asia. And I believe that's where the majority ended up mm -hmm. settling roughly because the Soviet authorities almost tried to forget their involvement for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. so, um, I would like to add to that, uh, this is a studied subject a bit, the majority of the Greeks coming from the former Soviet Union their present in the Soviet Union is not connected to the Civil War. Mm -hmm. They were basically Greeks moving from Greek-speaking areas or Greek-speaking communities, especially on the southern coast, coast mm -hmm. of the Black Sea, that moved to Russia in the 19th century. So yeah. there's no direct connection. Yeah. It was only a, a comparatively a, a small right. minority that, mm -hmm. that moved to the Soviet During Union this and was time incorporated. Into and especially, but they, they often yeah. had a separate life. They had a completely right. different life. They were much more privileged. The, the political refugees, mm -hmm. as they were called, right. that left, left after the civil war and went to the yeah. Soviet Union, than ones who lived there for generations. Yeah, already. and then as you mentioned that now, I, I agree with that. Uh, I know that uh, and again, this is sports specific, but the coach of the uh, uh, wrestling team in Kalithea is from Russia. Uh, but he says his, fam yeah, too, his, his family uh, came here, came back here uh, 200 years ago. They were Greeks that came yeah. back 200 yeah. years ago, as you were referring yeah. to. So so I, I had experience yes, with that as well. And I suppose there were also quite a lot of George, George Georgians. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure that's true. Well, I, I, James's uh, talk has opened up a number of questions. I think um, uh, with the passage of time, though, we see cy cycles of uh, events and sometimes we think it's time maybe for a discussion and then something flares up about um, uh, this period in Greek history but also um, uh, maybe we can find out from uh, Christopher uh, Grafos uh, whether the uh, Canadian, uh, the Greek Canadian History Project is looking into the, into the issue of where uh, Greek immigrants came from and why. I certainly know from uh, my experience in the Niagara Peninsula of Ontario, that most of the, the Greek population uh, come from uh, Laconia, um, and that uh, this was an area certainly that was very much devastated both during the uh, German occupation and then in the Civil War. So, uh, no, none of us, especially as a uh, non-Greek, talked about such why they came. And it's an interesting uh, issue of looking at these connections and certainly. Uh, uh, Greek presence in the Black Sea region is, has long history, and in fact, they, many of the revolutionaries of, uh, that uh, thought about a, a Greek nation came from there and were active uh, uh, citizens in the countries there, especially the Tsarist Russia. So, we have many topics that we can talk about. 